Welcome to the Mom and Mind podcast. I'm your host, perinatal mental health psychologist, Dr. Kat. I am deeply, deeply honored to host Grammy award-winning singer, songwriter, thought leader, and wholeness advocate, Alanis Morissette. And she is joined in this interview by President and CEO of Postpartum Support International, Dr. Wendy Davis. Alanis found PSI as a resource when she was dealing with perinatal mental health challenges and has shared PSI's resource on her tour. She's been such a powerful presence, not only in the music world, but also in her advocacy for mental health. And she has been vocal about experiencing postpartum depression or postpartum activity, as she's coined it. But in this episode, she shares more than ever about what that experience was like for her, the impact of that, and how she's found her way to healing. Being in the public eye and being a performer is a whole other level of pressure, and it leaves celebrities open to basically all of the projections of other people. And I imagine a ton of pressure, especially going through perinatal mental health conditions. She's had to manage all of her experiences under that bright and sometimes stinging light. And through all of that, she has still found her way to healing. And Dr. Wendy Davis, who's been connected with PSI as a volunteer since 1997, became the executive director in 2009 and now president and CEO. She was drawn to this work after healing from postpartum depression and since has been a passionate advocate and leader in the world of perinatal mental health. I've been able to see Wendy in action at PSI for the last several years and more recently have worked closely with her as the board chair of PSI. Her heart-centered and help-seeker-centered approach to leadership has grown PSI into the leading perinatal mental health nonprofit it is today. As you can imagine, I'm very excited for this interview, and I know you are too. So let's hear from Alanis and Wendy. Welcome. Thank you, Alanis, so much for being here. We appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Wendy and I are really, really honored Um, that you're here to share your story. And as you know, and I know we'll talk about um, hearing other people's stories really helps other people to not feel alone Mm -hmm. and having um, your presence here, your story here, I know is important to so many people who do feel alone and who feel like it's only happening to them. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, It's an honor to be with you both. I know how much care and contribution you've been giving around this topic to the planet. And it's my honor to be here with you because I care very deeply about this. Thank you. Um, And it's uh, having heard some of the interviews you've done, um, I haven't heard you bring it up, but I haven't really heard your story like Mm. in, in, you know, much depth. Um, Because I haven't told it. (laughs) That might be why. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Be why. Well, I have, I have tons of questions about that. Um, yeah. because it doesn't, it doesn't sound like you're not willing to share. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but I have some suspicions as to what why people don't want to hear about it. Well, <laughs> maybe we can just start there, but <laughs> that's where we're starting. That's no. where we're starting. Yeah. It's, it's one of our questions actually is you know, having your level of fame and celebrity is it's, it's his own thing. It's its um, own trauma. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I'll have a question about later. Um, but yeah. Why do you think people aren't asking you more about your story? Well, I mean, on a personal level, I have my survival strategy has hovered around uh, people pleasing, which is not a huge shocker for so many of us women. Um, in a context of patriarchy, it's a smart survival strategy <laughs> uh, until it starts eating away at our bodies and mental health and well being in general. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, I haven't, I believe I haven't been asked my story for several reasons. Uh, one of which is that a lot of people sort of look to me for upliftment or mm. support or guidance or maybe even direction or championing. Um, And in some ways, the archetype of that kind of leadership is at odds with the truth of what was happening and the truth of depression and the the truth of postpartum activity in my case, because if only it had just been depression, (laughs) you know, depression is its own swamp. But there are so many other elements involved in the postpartum activity party. Um, (laughs) So, um, 
Yeah, I think a lot of people don't want to hear about the darkness and the swamp. Perhaps they're dwelling in so much of it on their own end personally that they may not want to have that be compounded by mine. Although there is so much beauty inside the the challenging times. And certainly now I have a, a, an element of objectivity with a little bit of distance from the three postpartum, I can't even call it just depression, postpartum activities that I had that got progressively worse. Mm -hmm. I now have some objectivity. So it's only now, to be honest, my son, my youngest is almost five in August. Mm -hmm. And and I actually hear that number a lot chrono chronologically with kids that when your youngest is five, there is a coming to of sorts. Mm -hmm. And I'm in real time experiencing that right now and also starting to organize what actually happened because there was such a steely white knuckling through the last 13 years, right. frankly, mm -hmm. through the last 49 years, like, <laughs> but the last 13 years, um, it's just ratcheted up to a whole other degree of, of challenge and bereftness and frozenness and all the qualities that come along with postpartum activity. So I'm only now almost five years away from my third birth, um, I'm able to unpack some of it now and organize some of it and have some of it make more sense. And then frankly, the two predominant feelings that were just sublimated by the very nature of me having to show up um, right. were uh, deep, deep grief and rage. Hey. <laughs> so those are my two beautiful chestnut friends. <laughs> Um, who, who were just my friends throughout this process of unpacking it. And it, you know, I can't, I can't do it alone. I couldn't do postpartum alone yet. I was trying, mm -hmm. you know, the alone thing is just the, the egregious lie that permeates culture that somehow autonomy for the win. But mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Boo. Boo to that. Yeah. Yeah. Boo to, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I do agree. I mean, there must be obviously I have no idea what it's like to have the kind of pressure, um, that you have just from the public that piece to, to be and maintain a certain level of energy and a, just a certain presence. Mm. Um, that is its own, um, own thing. Then again, I, I would like to, to talk a little bit about, um, but specifically to, to what you were describing mm -hmm. before, um, the um, a level to which people don't know what to do with mm -hmm. things like postpartum depression. Like when you say the word postpartum depression, do you get, do you have a sense of people sort of like turning away or being like, Oh, and uh, just not knowing what to do with it. Yes. And I think the, the, the deeper and perhaps even overarching part of this is that a lot of us don't know what to do with our own humanity. <laughs> Yes. And for those of us who've constructed an entire egoic identity, nice to meet you, mm -hmm. around attempting to be empowered and attempting to be uplifting and attempting to be a bright light that walks into every room. And, you know, it's it's too it's too incomplete of a story, you know, and, the, and then these darker parts and the swampy covered in tar parts. And that's what yes. part of was for me, all three times progressively worse. Um, you know, this entered into a whole new self-perception too of, of maybe I am a human being and I'm vulnerable in a way that kind of goes against what my egoic identity was, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. this, you know, it's I've been proud uh, to put out into the world this archetype of me that is a combination of vulnerability and slightly mercurial, but also wildly serviceful and empowered and expressionful and but all of those things kind of die when when postpartum took hold. And I'll probably leap my way through this chat with you both. But um, it's like your whole self disappears. So. Right. So, yeah, do people turn away? Do people not want to hear about that? Of course they don't. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Until they do, until they're in it themselves. And there's some... Um, you know, there's that. It's exactly what you said when we just first started talking today. The the feeling of being alone in it is the worst part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So community has is everything, and yet there's so much talk from my own self about how important community is and to lean. But that's not the indoctrination that we've received. We receive that we need to just white knuckle it, especially Gen X. You know, God bless mm -hmm. us for that's still being here, <laughs> growing up on rusty nails. Um, but 
That's you know, there, there's this messaging that autonomy wins and, and extroversion wins and needlessness wins. And all of these things run counter to the exact things that, that moms need when they've given birth. We need everything that is the most vulnerable outreach. It's probably second to the initial attachment outreach of, of our babies and us as babies, mm -hmm. that vulnerable reach for help. Mm -hmm. And in my case, with my career and with my self-perception and, and how I've been projected upon and perceived publicly, everything I was experiencing was running counter to what I had known myself to be around as an example, being a great boss, mm -hmm. giving positive feedback to my team, um, giving guidance, supporting, um, congratulating, expressing gratitude, wisdom, visionary, future, where we're going as a team. So the leader part of me mm -hmm. was felt broken. And yet I, it's not like my team disappeared and my career disappeared and my archetypal role of supporting people wasn't just, you know, people still wanted the same thing from me, but I couldn't provide it anymore. Yes. And yet I was faking that I could. And there are a lot of people to this day, you know, I would say, yeah, I was, I was really not at my best during that time. You know, they'll say, well, I, I would never have known that you were smiling and you were presenting well, and wow, you're a high functioning alcoholic or you're a high functioning depressed person, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And I would say, yes. <laughs> yes, I am. But that doesn't, that doesn't change anything for me. It would just kind of keep things almost scaffolded or house of cards together. Mm -hmm. but, but the internal experience was, was quite devastating. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Wendy. Mm -hmm. You feel, um, Alana, <laughs> something you said feels so important. I resonate with so much with just starting with this, that you feel broken when this happens mm -hmm. and that um, sometimes we, as you have said so beautifully in many, many songs and mm. writing, mm. sometimes you, we have to break mm. um, to be born. And yeah. so, mm. but what you said is that there, it's both um, this archetype of mother is strong, but the archetype of strong mother right. is really strong. And so you were talking about this egoic identity and it's a coping strategy to be that strong leader, to bring joy, to give guidance. And, and it's a cultural archetype that we, that's what people want to see in mothers. That's all they want to see. They don't want to see all they want to see. <laughs> and I feel like for oh, wait, you, wait, could we qualify too? Yes. Sorry. When we say they, I don't yes. think women care. I, I think some women who are, who, those of us who have been really hewn into patriarchal mindset, because we're in this context, um, mm -hmm we can be equally sort of patriarchally hard on each other postpartum era or otherwise, but in general, women tend to be a little more open to this conversation, woman bodies. Um, and, and it's more the, the disempowered masculine that's not interested, but you were saying, something, I cut you off. Sorry. No, 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 please. Okay. Um, you yeah. are here to We're we're just <laughs> learning and listening to you. And so, yes, I think that, one of the things I was going to share is that we know as uh, advocates and people who help uh, pregnant postpartum individuals with lots of activity, mm -hmm. as you say, wow. is one of the risk factors going into this experience is the people that are really self-reliant, really autonomous, really leaders, high achieving perfectionists. Yeah. And because we've developed, that's what I'm resonating with you. We've developed that as a coping strategy, both sometimes for our families, for, for the planet, for ourselves. Yeah. And so when you go into this, what you said is this experience of becoming a mother, when you by by, by, nature we need community in that we don't know what to do at all and that's why we break harder so your healing comes i just have to say this to you you you're um a pioneer in expressing your vulnerability for many of us mm -hmm. and i can only and i've seen you do this now with your mothering journey as well and i just feel really grateful in fact that it's kind of coming together for you because it's the same thing that's led you to Everything. express yourself. <laughs> yes. 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 And now it's the break, but it's like this final, when you go into motherhood as a high achieving perfectionist, 
giving all the joy to everybody and you break, you really do lose a sense of yourself and you've been rebuilding that now, but I've seen you with your babies on the, on the videos. You didn't break for them. And that's the part yeah. that's heart heartrending is that we think we're not there at all. And yet you were, I was, and I wasn't, you know, and, and I, for me, the exercise of, cause my tendency is to beat myself up and just say this, yeah. you know, and even the other day I said to my now 13 year old son, I said, under my breath, I said something like, you know, and then my postpartum stuff, God, it had to have been so hard on you each. And he said, what do you mean? Yeah. And, you know, and, and I'm sure there's, you know, I have a copiously large amount of money set aside for their therapy when they get older. <laughs> um, but for me, it's bouncing between really seeing that I did everything I could combined with, yes, I failed you in a lot of ways. And I also loved you really, really deeply and well in a lot of ways. And can I hold that? You know, and so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really yeah. doing that. And it's not, you know, it's not always easy. I, th I think um, what you're describing is so spot on um, because it, I mean, our kids don't know us other than what they know of us. So they don't right. necessarily see it as failure, but we might not be feeling our motherhood journey or feeling uh, how we want to feel as, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like we're, yeah, like we're nailing it. And so it, it, it can be disappointing to us, but the juxtaposition between how we feel internally and what other people experience from us can sometimes be so different. Yes. Um, there it's like different experiences and yeah. <clears throat> as a deep processor, um, mm -hmm. you're like in there, me, Wendy, um, all, yeah. all HSPs are in mm -hmm. there really pulling all of this apart in a way that nobody else has access to. That's, mm -hmm. that's like us doing that. To yeah, us. Yeah. Our special filters have a unique capacity to do that. And we can't stop. Won't stop. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Probably will never. Um, we can. You, I don't right. think it's possible to stop being conscientious as a highly sensitive creature. It is, it is not possible. No. Yeah. Um, would you um, be open to walking us through some of your experiences um, mm -hmm. for whatever you're comfortable with sharing so that, so we can understand a bit about what you went through? Yeah. So um, I love how astute you both are and so experienced from the inside of us to the point where you could say postpartum activity is particularly challenging around those of us um, moms who have created and structured consciously or unconsciously the archetype of overcompensation you know carrying that invisible load that is that is heavier than anything anyone could ever understand unless they're doing it too which so right. many of us are right. um so when i had my first son all three births were home births um and that first birth was long it was 36 hours at home and I just, you know, there was nothing that could have prepared me for what was to come, you know, and I, I laugh with moms to be, I laugh with moms of six children, the whole, the whole lack of messaging around what one is about to encounter what, from pregnancy onward. It's just a complete rearrangement of all of life. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much just that it's right. like oh <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. worry you're just going to be completely yeah. turned upside down don't worry um <laughs> and it's all of the you know for me it's the it's the biochemical hormonal my my genetic pre predisposition to um depression the neurochemical aspects the environmental aspects you know the, my marriage my friendships where are they where did everybody go everyone's around me like uh, moths to flame when I'm flame what about when I'm sputtering and disgusting like where where did you go you know so there's the conditionality of friendships in my particular case there's there's the career element of mm -hmm. how bless so many of us career moms are just you know we just immediately think we have to we have to just jump right back into career so mm -hmm. after ever was born I just remember thinking I just need to get back to work because that's where my true identity is. And I don't, I haven't embraced the archetype of mother, frankly, to be honest at 49, almost 50, I'm still figuring out what this archetype of mom is mm -hmm. in a context that I want to be in, you right. know, so, mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, 
you know, it's still and coming at it from the fact that we are in a context of patriarchy. And, and that is a heavy lift out of the gate for us that can't be underestimated how much of a toll that takes. Um, you know, and then and then so many other elements. The the biggest one was where can I lean? You know, and I had hired postpartum, I privileged, right? Privileged position. So I had hired postpartum doulas and postpartum support. Um, I don't know these women. And some of them had issues with, oh, Alanis Morissette, who, who perhaps they had deemed as being some kind of a queen, impenetrable, mm -hmm. powerful queen. Here mm -hmm. is that Alanis Morissette, debilitated, broken, free bleeding, can't move, brain gone. So much of my identity was based on my cognitive ability to understand things and articulate them. I couldn't even finish a sentence. Right. Yeah. I just started being able to finish sentences. <laughs> Yeah. So, yes. I hear you. You know. So, um, so basically, all of what I'd known myself to be, as cobbled together as that was, and and as beautiful as that was in terms of identity, every single element of power was being chopped in half or killed. Mm -hmm. So then I was just left with this open wound in a way, vulnerability, super raw. Yet I was still in a position of attempting to guide people around me or influence or set boundaries or lead. And yet attempting to do that from a from quicksand. I mean, can it be done? I did it, but it's yeah. uh it takes a toll. Not recommended, yeah. Right. It did <laughs> did you have any sense right away that you were dealing with depression or anxiety or I I don't know the the different experiences you had, but like, what was that journey mm. like to figure out what was actually going on? My typical response to challenge is to turn it inward. You know, I'm an imploder. So when things, when the camera angle started to get this Dutch angle and everything started mm. to feel, it was a frog in a boiling pot for me. So it wasn't, I mean, there was an element of this high, 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 high progesterone bliss of the baby in the belly. And then all of a sudden on the other side, it was an intense drop. It was like I was dropped off the top of a building mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and every element came into play. Relationships, right. French, every relationship came to the fore in terms of what I could possibly reach out for and what was available for me. And at the time, not a ton was available. And that, that also, you know, another element that has to be brought into here is any sort of unaddressed trauma kind of sits there with a smirk on its face after birth too. It sort of sits there and goes, you want to deal with this now? Maybe right. <laughs> you're just standing mm. by all 753,000 of those parts that just want a minute, you know, and, yeah. and what winds up happening postpartum for me anyway, was I kept, I tabled everything because mm -hmm. there is this beautiful person here who I am in, you know, I'm enrolled in, in, in charge of making sure they make it. Right. So yes. this is a life or death thing. This isn't a, oh, we'll, we'll float in and out of this world. No, this is, this is your one job lady. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep this beautiful creature alive at the cost in my case of my own self. Right. Mm -hmm. Myself didn't even exist. So, and that can, that can exacerbate any invisibility issues that came from our own childhoods. It exacerbates all, all that tender stuff. So unless we have a, a robust team of psychotherapists who are somatically inclined and incredibly generous of spirit around us, which, you know, that's not a terrible idea, by the way. Um, yeah. Sounds good. Um, unless we have that around us, you know, there's a profound vulnerability that almost in my case, infantilized me. Mm. Um, and could I fake it? Could I have some seven-year-old part of me pretend to be the boss? Sure. Mm. <laughs> and I did. Right. But it was, it was deeply deep, a lot of so much suffering in there. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that I, I, in particular, because, um, it, I mean, you it have clearly had so much reflection and work on trying to understand all that has gone on, but this in particular is one of those things that people are shocked by. Um, even if they've done prior therapeutic work is mm -hmm. to all of a sudden be in this new phase of life, have this being to take care of and all of these past traumas come up mm -hmm. or come up in this new context. Yes. And like you, you're just trying to sleep um, yeah. and maybe go to the bathroom and take a shower, let alone deal with, oh my gosh, 
I can't believe that my parents did this to me or, you know, right. whatever it was in whoever's Fill in case. the blank. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you don't have the bandwidth for it. So like in order to cope and function, you have to put it aside. They, like what other choice do you have? Don't actually have a choice. Yeah. yeah. And tabling consciously when you're tabling for say an afternoon, because you're in the middle of a meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally doable unpack it later at midnight or whatever, but this is a years and years and years long tabling, mm. a recipe for some challenges. <laughs> for sure. And I'm, whether you, you meaning people, um, are consciously aware that it's still there or not, there could still be a felt sense that like something's not right. Something big is different. Yes. Even if you can't put your finger on it, it is a heavy weight to, to bear. Yes. And in order to unpack it in any way and form some kind of clarity or objectivity, for me, there has to be some cognitive muscle that can help me do that top down, bottom up. I want to work through this somatically. I want to work through this intellectually and academically and scholarly wise. I want, you know, I want to, I want to understand this in a whole way. And so without having the cognition at my fingertips in a way that I'd become used to throughout my lifetime, um, without having this, the sunlight in terms of biochemical and, and how debilitating it was and the anxiety off the charts. I mean, it's it just constantly feels like death is, a, is around the corner, <laughs> you know, it's like, whoo. So in the very qualities in myself that have been resources for my healing, I didn't have access to those. So it makes it doubly vulnerable. Uh, right. Which, um, that, I mean, can lead to feeling really lost. Um, I'm mean, like, where do you turn? If you, if you're usually super reliant on your own capacity to cope and manage, you mm. don't have that. And everybody else is like, who knows where, um, Right. And your experience is really internal. Like what I find have found so difficult in my own experience. And I think for Wendy and your own experience too, in our, um, postpartum, uh, journeys, um, is like to be able to articulate what you're feeling is a skill. And if yes. you don't know what you're feeling, you can't articulate it, not even to yourself. Right. Uh, so you're lost that like, and people around you aren't don't have access to understand what you're dealing with either, especially if they're used to you being verbal about it or being able to explain Empowered things. Around it. Yes. Or, and, and, and unpack it for others. Like part of my job also included, if I'm going through something tough, I have to package it well, articulate it beautifully and present it with a little pink ribbon. And it's like, I got no freaking rhythm ribbons right now. I have no rhythm or ribbons. <laughs> right. I had nothing. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, of so um, disorienting. Yes. And so that initial disorientation, and there is something, if, if someone has one child, that first child just cracks this all open. And I, to answer your earlier question, I didn't know I had postpartum depression. I just thought, oh, here's another chapter of things being weird for me. <laughs> okay. You know, um, and if the frog in the boiling pot element was that it just every day got worse and worse and worse, but I didn't notice it because it didn't feel like a massive quantum leap shift. It just felt like I was slowly dying. Oh, and, gosh. um, and it, I took first time around, I took a year and a half before I reached out. And I remember a very well-meaning postpartum depression expert doctor, you know, she was offering things to me like, you know, meditate and put your hands over your eyes. And, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, and, and, and some of the suggestions that were, that were maybe not robust enough to address what I was going through again, well-meaning, but entirely unhelpful to me mm -hmm. <laughs> because this was so much more, um, this was so much more than just let's learn how to breathe properly. And is breathing properly an element of support? Of course it is, but it's not the panacea. It's not the one way out. So I'd hear people say, and I'm sure you've heard this billions of times, but you know, go for a run, get outside, take your vitamin C and God bless them. They're well-meaning. And there is also an element of them going, go back to who you were. We liked her better, you know, or why don't you call us when you're over this thing you're going through that we don't care about, you know? So 
so it's not even just isolation it's isolation and and basically being abandoned by culture Mm -hmm. whoa and you can't find yourself and so, usually how we would find ourselves in the past would be various forms, right? Chatting mm-hmm. with friends, crying with someone you feel safe with, talking to multiple therapists, having your family around the odd family member that doesn't drive you crazy and you're giggling with them. Or, but none of that was there. Either. That's working. Mm-mm. What if when you reach back to that first time, mama, that you were off the top of your head, what what do you wish someone had said to you earlier <laughs> What would have really made you feel seen and held? I think more humans with with a big heart who, to be honest, it's really vulnerable, but just someone who had more space to offer me, not just I'm going to drop by, talk about how adorable your baby is and Mm -hmm. smooch you and then leave and not see you for another six months. Mm -hmm. More time. Yeah. it's really actually sweetly a, a attachment stuff. Like I needed, yes. I wanted my head in a bosom, you know, mm-hmm. I wanted the mothering, the mother, beautiful literature out there. Like I wanted to be nurtured. I needed to be nurtured. This wasn't a want, right. you know? Um, and this, it's just a real survival mode. Any parent with young kids, you know, we all just kind of look at each other cross-eyed to begin with, whether mm-hmm. there's postpartum activity or not. So it's already a hotbed of holy shit. Mm-hmm. And then you add on top of it, this element, and then how that affects your marriage or friendships or deeply intimate team. You know, you're, you're not who they knew you to be perhaps when they married you, or, you know, this is the darkest self they're going to see. Right. And it, I feel sad about the lack of bandwidth that we have as humans to hold space for the true, true, dark, vulnerable experiences that we all have. You know, I know people challenged by bipolar, postpartum depression, general depression, heavy anxiety. To walk away from those people when they're in the middle of needing you the most is so sad. It is. Mm-hmm. It's it terrible. Is. It really mm-hmm. is. I think you you said it like the abandonment. It yeah. does feel like that. Um, and, and like you, what do you, what do you say to somebody? Like you, you say, feel well, abandoned well, by you? <laughs> no, like, no, and, and by you, the way, I tried that too. I'd be like, where is everybody? And I'd write them notes. Where are you? You know? Mm. And I, you know, and, and, in you know, I can't even say in their defense, but, um, you know, some people are like, well, Lannis, you're pretty good at hiding it. And I'm like, fuck you. Right. Oh, <laughs> I don't care. I don't care how good I am at hiding it. I'm a fucking human being, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. That's a little tough. That's a, uh, it has a little like gaslighty feel. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really tough. And, and as you were um, talking through this, there's still that whole other layer of the, the fame and celebrity mm. part of it that um, I can, I, I don't know how the math works out on this, but is at least doubly difficult um, if you're, I'd say 37%. No, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it's, it, it compounds it off the charts. Mm. Um, and I think if I can broad stroke it, I think I was, I've, I've been pretty lonely most of my life. And so I thought fame naively, I thought fame would help mitigate that. You know, it would be, I'd be hanging out with all these other small part of the bell shaped curve freaks of nature who have odd gifts and we're, we'd all be kumbayaing and loving each other up and validating and empathizing and championing. And, but inside the world of fame, quite the opposite was true. Certainly in the nineties, and in the music industry and in patriarchy, I mean, rock and roll, you're probably not going to see a more patriarchal environment. So, so the opposite wound up being true. And I wound up feeling more isolated and, and less connected. I thought it would yield and, and afford me this kind of connective experience with people. Um, but it didn't, it actually kind of made it more challenging. So in, in that regard, having fame around, which is, uh, you know, you're basically volunteering unwittingly often to be a blank screen upon which people project all their stuff onto you. And some part of that is amazing, like project away, you know, and some of it is really taxing because then you wind up feeling like a screen versus a human being who, you know, as an example, fame is an interesting, unusual one in that when I meet people, there's a tendency for them to monologue at me 
because mm -hmm. they assume they assume I get regaled with being mirrored or affirmed or loved up or validated, which I don't. Um, mm -hmm. So they assume the assumption is that I'm riddled and abundantly surrounded by positive feedback every single day, and I can't take any more. You know, that not being the case, and them thinking that winds up being these kind of jangly, disconnected interactions relationally where I'm, I'm learning a lot about someone else, but I'm not egalitarian style sharing back and forth parody. Mm -hmm. That kind of flies out the window a little bit, unless you're an extrovert and you love monologuing at people. That's not really my thing. Right. So yeah, mm -hmm. but I know a lot of extroverts in Hollywood who thrive <laughs> on the monologuing back and forth. I'm like, it's just heartbreaking to me. I'm too Canadian. <laughs> oh yeah there's that <laughs> yes oh, yes but I don't speak unless someone asks me a question so you haven't asked me a question in three years that's why I haven't been speaking <laughs> um yeah that uh it, it's it makes everything so much more complex I'm at least what I'm hearing yes. from you and learning from yeah. you about it and it's more exploitative and it's it just also, it just gets to a point where my existence seems to trigger people. Now it can trigger people in a positive way. It can catapult them into some self-expression or them knowing themselves more. But a lot of times it triggers people because they assume things. There might be a bias about wealth or a bias about uh, a talent or a gift, you know, and a lot of it is just, it brings up stuff. Having a famous person sitting across from someone, it can bring stuff up for them. So so that already clouds the possibility of a gentle, interactive, pure relational experience, you know, precludes you from it almost. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in the meantime, you're dealing with postpartum activity, uh, depression, anxiety, all of that stuff. Yeah. And I hear women, you know, some people call me and, and bless it. I'm now in a position where my phone slightly blows up with women who are in the same position that I've been in. And um, I, I love it, by the way. The fact that I can turn this around and squeeze the lemonade out of this is the greatest. Um, but I hear, you know, someone will say, my wife's going crazy. She was driving and then she had to pull over. I'm like, wait, why is she even driving? She shouldn't yeah. be driving. You know, like that, those kind of very basic things. Like my wife was cleaning the kitchen and, and then all of a sudden she, I'm like, stop. Why is she cleaning the kitchen? <laughs> nice. She's dying. She should not be cleaning that kitchen. Nice. You know what I mean? So, so I love being the voice of, wait, wait, what? No. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's basically mm -hmm. the voice that has, that you, you asked earlier what I might have benefited from. You use different words, but from receiving it's a sisterhood. Mm -hmm. It's a sisterhood that comes in and gets protective mm -hmm. and even micromanaging on your behalf. You know, like those are the sisters I needed around me. Yeah. The true aunties. The aunties. Like, let, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let her rest, bring her some food. She should yeah. not be the strong and active one in the family, in the house right now. And bless your heart for saying that to people who call you. Like, hold on. Hold on. Not okay. <laughs> Even me just going, not okay that she's driving. I feel like that's my contribution. You know, that's a plenty right. contribution in that moment. Like, let's look at wow, we're asking someone who has two broken legs to run a marathon. There's something very sick about that. It's sick culturally. It's not okay. Thousand and percent. it is a symptom of, of village full, village listeness because if there were 13 or 32 adults around at any given time, first of all, I believe on an educative developmental level with kids, that's where they thrive. They thrive knowing this uncle knows everything about space. Yes. And this yes. aunt knows everything about the brain. And this aunt is just hilarious and her comedic intelligence off the chart. You can't swing a dirty sock without ha having a positive influence in some regard with all the multiple intelligences that we have. We can't subsist with, with these closed death-defying systems of the nuclear family in a pod floating along the satellites. Like, no, we need to be kind of inextricably connected with each other, mm -hmm. period. So true, true. Yeah. Communal, even for the yeah. introverts or especially for the introverts. Actually, so it's not a big deal to go out and see someone, but you are seeing people every day. Yep. Process of life. And yeah. I, I really am feeling for you 
you know, what you have been able to do and what you needed truly for healing. And that's what Kat and I talk about this a lot. There's treatment, whatever, all kinds. And then there's healing. Mm -hmm. And for you, for healing, you needed to be seen as like the emerging and unique person that you are. And there's so many layers where people weren't seeing you and you, you need that. It isn't enough to say, find your own identity. And so I really am feeling what you're talking about. And also you're still healing that. And we are, I just want to say this to you. We are seeing you. I I feel you and I see right now. Um, what your, your, the thing that helped me in my healing was people simply saying, I got you. I see you. You're still in there. You're different. You're different. Yeah. And I, it's like learning how to swim. And I'm like, I want to go back to shore. I'm a person who walks on land. I I don't know (laughs) how to swim, but you're swimming. You're there. Yes. yes, yes. So if you have someone say you're swimming right now. Nice work, honey. Just Just, you're doing great. And wow. You know, and You're even, learning. Even, even the fact that we're still here, like I look at some women and I go, the fact that we're still here is a miracle because when you get into the really dark shit, like the right. suicidal stuff and the, right. you really don't think you're going to be here. Right. So then you're here. <laughs> it's like, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, well, how, I mean, I know that's a tough question <laughs> for all three of us. How did that happen? Do you have ways that you feel like that's what I was led by that's what I held on to or that's what got me to the next shore yeah what was that for you the kids yes you know, and, and, yeah and and yes were there moments of challenge around bonding here and there yeah but that is all for me that was all easily easily explained you know I could biochemically explain that in an instant it was having if I was having ambivalence that acted out in terms of the dynamic of bonding like there's this pressure on every mom that you you know, and I happen to have had the the gooey, ooey, yummy oxytocin party of, oh my God, <laughs> the skin on skin attachment, big check mark, you know? So, so that was going on. And concurrently, there was also, how, what does this bond even mean? And, and all the trauma that it brings up for our existential wounds too. Like mm-hmm. I'm even here, I was raised around a lot of narcissism. So there's this lack of sense of a felt physical sense of self sometimes. Mm-hmm. So bringing that in my bag into the postpartum it was this perfect storm you know and then circumstantially I'm being sued or my dog's being kidnapped or you know like there's all this sort of targeting for people in the public eye certainly women in the public eye yes empath highly sensitive boom the perfect target for sociopaths psychopaths and narcissists so all of this shit is concurrently happening while I'm inside of this experience Mm-hmm. it's too much to process it's, it's too much to process <laughs> it's too much at the time it was and so I'm only now beginning to look at and and you know circling back to the feelings so many feelings that I just had to table you know and and the sadness is one you know I crying without saying like I'll just have to redo that or reshoot it or no nope you're feeling sad and you're crying and then you're communicating and then there you are like having more of a neutrality and even a warmth toward these unfelt feelings, particularly grief. Mm -hmm. And it's not a blame. It's not a victim consciousness. You both know that it's not a blame. It's a just marking what was so that it can heal. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, listed two huge things like that, that grief and the rage, those are so real and Mm. not ones that are, well, especially rage, like women aren't supposed to be angry and all that nonsense. (laughs) Um, but it, it comes up big time in the context of postpartum because there's so much change, so much like loss of identity, change in identity. Um, the, the anchor comes up and rage comes up for so many different reasons. Okay, and I have to tell you one of the most validating moments postpartum was I read some funny article on social media somewhere and, and this woman was speaking and she goes, and then there's the rage mist. She called it a rage mist. <laughs> I love it. Rage mist for life. <laughs> right. So now instead of saying I'm feet, you know, I'm, I'm filled with rage. I just go, I'm in my rage mist. You know? <laughs> So I love it. Although to any degree that it attempts to temper the power of rage, let's not do that. But right, um, right. Mm-hmm. just the fact that it was even being. No, it just gives up. it a, 
gives it a home, you know? And a familiarity and a casual element to it because the more we can normalize rage and grief and terror, I mean, that's another third chestnut that was just Mm -hmm. a bed fellow the whole time, like waking up and just the intrusive thoughts and, you know, happily going along, cutting my carrots and then boom, death, despair, decay, right? dead. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, you know, panic attacks just, and, and interestingly, you know, talk about the, the lemons and the lemonade here is I got really good at somatically working and walking myself through a panic attack. Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that, I, I don't take that lightly. I'm just like, dang, right. that's a skill. Dang, I know that's how to a do life this. skill. It is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yes, does the resilience grow? Sure. But that was no consolation when I was in it. I don't care. People would be like, it's going to get better. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> that reassurance is actually quite dismissive. It, it's very it, like, it, it ends up making you feel like you're not being seen. Like yeah. okay, the overarching message is stop, stop bothering me with your humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know what to do with you being upset. So I'm just going to tell you it's going to be fine. Yeah. Uh, I get it. And and inside that there's a piece of sweetness. Sure. But the, but the ideal generous love of a postpartumly challenged woman is just fucking hold space for her. Pardon my French. Like that's all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold space, hold space. Mm -hmm. And God bless Mm -hmm. my husband because he held a lot of space. Mm -hmm. I'm only Mm -hmm. now starting to apologize to him. I point over there because I did it yesterday where I'm just like, honey, the fact that you're still here is amazing because mm. I didn't behave that well with him. Mm. And and he's the first to say he didn't behave that well in moments with me too. So mm-hmm. I'm not taking, you know, I'm not taking too much responsibility, but it wasn't wildly pleasant to be married to me during that time, but there I was there you kicking are. ass <laughs> and, That's not, right. and not knowing I was doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's there. I mean, there's so much, and this is years you're talking about your experience mm. from the first postpartum to the, um, five years ago. That's a, a huge span of time to be in some level of, of suffering. Dismay. Uh, yeah. 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 And you, you found some way to start on your path to healing. Um, and you mentioned therapy a couple of times, but like, what, what were the, the things that that the elements you of on your support. Journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, knowing you both existed was huge. So that really, you know, that's, that really <laughs> entered me into this, into this fray of going, it can't possibly just be me. When I wrote Jagged Little Pill, I truly felt youthfully and naively that I was, you know, it's not uncommon. I felt like I was alone in my pain. Mm-hmm. And when I wrote it and people around the planet resonated with it, it was a quick realizing of the fact that I was not alone in my pain mm-hmm. and, and that other people were going through this similarly. So not unlike how I would conjure women who'd given birth before me when I was giving birth to ever at home, when I reached that point of, I can't do this <laughs> in the birth process, And I just, all I did was I just pictured the billions of women who have given birth and that they did it. Uh, I just used that as a resource the whole time. But when I really, you know, when I, when I found out that you existed and saw how many people you were helping, and then I was doing interviews after ever was born and touching on it for sure, because how could I not? But, um, Yeah, that that became a bit of an anchor for me, uh, one of the many resources, the anchor of knowing that I wasn't alone and that there was a way for me to connect planetarily with those who were in the same place. Um, I did have a little bit of a challenge around the fame piece being an extra complication. So, you know, that's that's a unique thing that I'm addressing with various therapists um, who have experience with people in the public eye. So that's been helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, because it is as you said it's a unique perspective um not one that can't be worked through apparently um so so yeah the um that that was one of the resources knowing that there was a macrocosmic connectivity that could allow me to have this microcosmic painful acute experience be something that could connect me boom I was like oh that's amazing Mm -hmm. um was this um it this was like finding PSI as a resource Finding PSI as a resource and then seeing how many people were availing themselves of your resource Mm -hmm. 
and then realizing in speaking with a couple of other women and then being more public about this conversation and then my phone starting to blow up mm. uh, this is happening to so many women quietly and it mm. killed me actually right. no. it killed me because the thought of anybody experiencing what I experienced alone like if I think of that for too long I'm right. I, no, I, I empathy. I, I, I mean Wendy and I have a very similar experience to what you're describing it's just I like when we went through our own in, in our different times, um, mm. just realizing how many people go through this is, uh, I, I, there's not a word for it. It makes me, angry. how about not? Okay. <laughs> yeah. How about, <laughs> how about no, <laughs> yeah. how about no? Yeah. Well, you're part of the big, how about no on this one? <laughs> Saying how no, about no, how about not ignoring women? and hating them mm -hmm. it's really it's really hate you guys <laughs> it's hate it's mm -hmm. hate a woman because how do you let a woman in that much pain how do you leave her alone right ah. and, and archetypally i mean the world comes from the woman <laughs> it's like yes right so it's looking at the divine feminine it's looking at the disempowered masculine or toxic masculinity if you want to call it that i call it the disempowered masculine because mm -hmm. empowered masculinity is only there to serve and uphold the woman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean really mm -hmm. so bringing That's the empowered masculinity online as we let ourselves because there's this big imperative for women and this big beating of this drum around, you know, we got to be empowered. We got to be empowered. Hey, guess what? I'm not always empowered. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not, you know, but, yeah. but the invitation for, to look at the versions of masculine and feminine and, and their empowered iterations and their disempowered ones, you know, in terms of a resource, the empowered masculine was huge inside women bodies too. And that's, oh, that's sure. the agency of a woman coming in going, no, 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 you're not asking her to do that anymore. That's mm -hmm. empowered divine masculine in us, mm -hmm. you know? So the empowered versions of both were what was being asked of overall during postpartum. And that wasn't showing up as much as I would have liked. So couldn't show up in me. I, you know, I could fake empowerment in a conversation, but then I'd get off the phone or the zoom or whatever. And I'd be, I'd feel all broken again. Right. Oh, or that's, yeah. it takes a lot of energy to hold that yeah. together. Yes. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Wendy? Yeah. Well, I just have loved listening, Alanis, to how um, you talk about how your children have brought you, not cognitively, this is part of the healing, is yes. experientially and somatically have brought you an awareness of tenderness and love that's just spontaneous. And I want to just say, I want to make sure I go back to one thing you said. So I think that people don't realize that you could be experiencing this kind of horror feeling like you're gonna die terror rage mm. and when I asked what got you through what did she say oh my kids yeah. and I don't think people realize that a woman can be going through this torment and be really loving oh, these love. yes Yes. And I think Adrian Rich actually talks about this really beautifully, but so do you. And one of the things I've heard you say in other interviews is, oh, well, the tenderness and love that I see when I look at my children is so obvious. So you are learning, learning to use that when you look at yourself. And when I hear you talk about empowerment and I think about the empowered people, man in my life, um, and my empowerment as I get older, it really is allowing that tenderness and that he doesn't need me to be any one thing. Yeah. I don't need me to be any one thing. Honestly. And you are expressing it all the time, even while you're being honest about how you're knitting it together. Mm -hmm. I just need to say to you, it is still coming out of you that that tenderness and sweetness is about letting it be yourself, yes. letting yourself Yes. And your, um, your husband's ability to hang in there with you and still be in the conversation is the same sweetness that I've heard you use that word. Yes. And it is there. I mean, I'm completely obsessed with my children mm -hmm. and frankly, have, you know, I was obsessed with them from before they were, were even here, you know, and mm -hmm. yes, various miscarriages and just, you know, staying that course. And there was an element of I want to meet these people and I, you know, there's some spiritual 
yeah limp <laughs> that just over overrode any personal experience I was having and it just mm -hmm. stayed the course and it just said these three people you're <laughs> you're being asked to to yeah. shepherd them or hold them and and there's going to be some challenges around it, but that is the epicenter for me. And I think those of us who are advocacy oriented and serviceful oriented, we have massive love in our bodies and our hearts and our missions. It's like, it just carries us. So thank God for that blimp. Um, <laughs> and thank God for love because it is love because love, mm -hmm. love is what helped is helping me heal now. It's what helped me hold it together ish then. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's allowing me to see that, you know, I think someone on maybe CNN asked me why in God's green heaven earth, would you ever have more children when you know postpartum depression? And I think my answer at the time was something along the lines of, but look at them. <laughs> I love these people so much. I'll do anything, you know? And, and so you mentioned earlier too, that, that the concurrent feelings of I can be riddled with terror enraged, lost, depressed, suicidal, ready to die, and be totally in love, have no regret about any choice I've made. Mm -hmm. um, I'd do it again, you know, so that, so that, so really seeing us humans, but in this case, us moms and women bodies as the multitudinous creatures that we are. Right. And I love it when I chat with my kids and, and they, I ask them how they're feeling, or if I'm volunteering at, at my son's school, like just saying, how are you feeling? And them saying, oh, I feel excited, but I also feel bored. And I also feel, and I'm like, yes, you can feel 17 right. things at once. <laughs> and those all make perfect sense to me. Right. Um, you know, we can isolate some of them if they need a little more attention, some part that's upset or some part that's tired or some part that needs a sandwich or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the big piece of postpartum depression and the empathy that is asked to be offered to these super heroines that's it. You know, when I do hands-on work, when I'm holding space, when I'm listening, when I'm empathizing, when I'm answering a question, it's from that place of love. And that has been a resource for me, knowing that even when the pilot light is super snuffed out, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. That's somewhere in the middle of this death swamp <laughs> is, is life and is love. And it, it gets very somatic. Because intellectually, I no longer had that resource. I would read books. You know, I had Raynaud's in my nipples, which is a pure joy. <laughs> and the doctors couldn't diagnose it. And uh -huh. I, you know, I was up breastfeeding at four in the morning, flipping through all my amazing books that I had. And I come across this page. Some people have Raynaud's in their nipples. Oh, that was the searing pain that I've been feeling for six months that I just haven't been sharing with anybody. Uh -huh. You know, so yeah. stuff like that where you know, just basically doing whatever I could and reading whatever I could and listening, but there was that disconnect of lack of love. Right. right. And I, I think that when you're talking about, you know, who knows what spirit and spirituality means? I don't have a definition. I just like to see it and express yeah. it. Yeah, and, and you, you do all the time. <laughs> And so you're like, you're talking about something that let's just say exists separate from what's in our heads. And that's what I hear you talking about. So even despite ourselves, despite yourself, mm -hmm. you were still moving forward and still are. Um, you are, I feel like as you learn about love, you honestly are teaching because you're expressing it all the time. Mm -hmm. Even right now, you mm -hmm. are saying, what is this thing? It's so powerful that it makes you forget for a minute what you were going to say, because mm -hmm. it's not up here. It's, it's not, not cognitive. It's not. And so, that's a big piece. But, you know, those of us who are particularly academic or scholarly, there's a tendency to like theory <laughs> wins the day, right? <laughs> the article, the brilliant article wins the day for me. And it still does. Come on. Yeah. Um, but with this being sort of in decline for a hot minute there and realizing <laughs> that, you know, in my grave, this isn't going to be cooking, <laughs> you know, so, so getting back into the body. And that's why I do love all the somatic therapies and they've been powerful because the non-sexual touch around birth and postpartum, all the sexual traumas come up from, for me, it did. Right. 
So, you know, it, there's a relearning touch element in terms of just sort of peppering what the resources were for me. One of them was just touch, non-sexual, non-exploitative, you know, because touch can be so charged. Very. Um, yeah. But I think throwing out the baby of touch with the bathwater because we're all, you know, the, yeah. the idea of touch is so fraught in culture, especially in America, mm-hmm. you know, but that was a big piece too, just I'm here, I exist, someone's touching a shoulder and apparently that shoulder's mine and, you know, sinking into that. So touch was huge. So in in your experience, we were talking before about just, you know, being able to share your story and talk about it. And um, when I was listening into interviews to hear about your story, um, like I said, when we first started, it was, I I didn't hear a whole lot and Mm -hmm. it made me curious uh, for you and your experience, what are the things you want to say and want people to hear and want people to know? Uh, you know, the big, the big one is that, you know, I don't always love hearing you're not alone Mm -hmm. (laughs) because for me, the big question immediately after is, well, what do you mean? I actually am, you know, and I appreciate, and Zoom and, and internet and all of that is brilliant for those of us to, you know, and I'm even cultivating my own sense of community. Um, there is something about face-to-face eye contact, feeling their, smelling their breath, you know, whether it's a mom or a sister or an auntie mm-hmm. or somebody. Um, So that was huge touch, any kind of non-sexual safe touch, massage therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, All the work I had done prior was really helpful, but I really leaned on the parts work. Like this is the part of me that is depressed. There's Mm -hmm. another part of me that actually isn't depressed that I can access and, and, and use as a resource internally here. Mm -hmm. Um, Hearing from other moms who were on the other side was helpful. Right. Um, that was a, a big deal. So again, a lot of this is relational, right? Yeah. Um, medication was was very helpful for me. I have zero qualms or stigma around taking medication. It saved my life. Right. So Thank I you I for did. So yeah, and and absolutely may not be a for everyone, but it was one thousand percent important for me. Um, right. And I, I hope it's okay to say this. I don't think I'm speaking out of school, but Brooke Shields was actually really helpful for me because mm-hmm. she was the only one at the time whom I'd known as a public figure who had commentary on this in a very overt way. Right. So I actually had the privilege of, of, of speaking with her and I, I know her through acquaintances. So um, she was just really supportive. And I was, I was expressing investigating medication and she was just supportive. And, and that was huge. It was a short conversation. And I hope it's okay. I'm bringing it up, but it was, it was massive support for me. Um, mm-hmm. So medication for the win. And I did have to experiment with which ones worked better and they have their own, as you know, more than anybody, they have all their own symptoms and side effects and everything, but, but me not wanting to die was, was well, I'll take it. Yes. <laughs> I'll take the side effects. Thank you. I, you know, and I, and the, yeah. the, the turnaround with the medication was pointed and it was for me, it was fast. Oh, great. And all of a sudden, a little bit more pep in the step came back and, and just physically recognizing a, my own body. I'd known vitality. I'd known awakeness and alertness and, and sort of leaning in black stallion style, you know. <laughs> so, so some of the medication helped me with that. Um, we talked about community and, and, and how important it is to really cultivate it before baby is actually something I would say yeah, too. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah get, get your, get your gang, you know, and, and maybe those of us who are supporting people who are about to give birth for the first time, letting them know that it's a bit of a shit show <laughs> as opposed to going, your baby's oh, yeah. going to be so beautiful. <laughs> and yes, that's true. Uh, yes. you know, and I do know women that coast through this like water off a duck's back and sure. I'm just like, wow, that's an inspiration to me. <laughs> Uh, Because that was not my experience. So for those of us who are challenged by it, like just really getting your your friend ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also maybe even going out on a limb while your progesterone's high and going, this is gonna be, this is gonna be gnarly and I'm gonna need you. Mm -hmm. And and even getting specific, because once I'm in postpartum, my directives are a little washy at best, right? So just saying things like, hey, a visit every month is not is not what I'm talking about. You know, and hopefully some friends have bandwidths enough, 
you know, and those of us who are in privileged enough positions to have people around us, but that's a double-edged sword too, because then you're interacting with people you don't necessarily know mm -hmm. in a very mm -hmm. vulnerable state. Uh, relationship stuff is huge. Yeah. So, so any kind of therapeutic intervention in the middle of it is, is powerful. But again, it's really incumbent upon those who support postpartum women to really know what they're talking about. Well, that's yes. true. That's a big deal because I've met a lot of people who I'm like, wow, I noticed that you have a PhD after your name, but maybe not direct experience with this one, you know, or I, I was just shocked at how many people in the medical field had no idea. Right. It is. It's still shocking. It's like, it, wow, it's, really? Yeah, we were trying to do the work to, to get the word out there and get people some training and information yeah, and normalize and, it like this. You're yeah, going to be yeah, yeah. this as a doctor, right? It's like, know it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll help you. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We'll help you with we'll, that. We will help you with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, medication, community, setting up relationships as best as possible, um, therapeutic intervention, biochemical stuff. You know, I had a little bit of hormone replacement, tiny bit, which really helped. Um, and then just also finding a space of safety to be, you know, and I know there's no such thing as us being broken. I get it. But to, but to feel broken, we're not broken, mm -hmm. but to feel broken in a safe environment and be able to sort of poke around in those swamps um, with, uh, right. with a supportive other who loves you, you know. Um, and if that's not at our fingertips, you know, online resources, what you're offering people, me chatting once in a while, a really, really empathic song or any, any sort of sensual support, you know, is it going to be the panacea that turns everything around? Like those of us who want us to be smiley again would, would prefer? No, no, it's not. Um, but it might make the ride a little tiny bit smoother. Um, so that looks, for me, it looked like broth and warmth and hot mats and hot water bottles mm -hmm. and soup. You know, I just, I just kept cycling around warmth. At the end of the day, though, there was no way for me to wiggle out of it. And God, yeah. I'm so used to wiggling out of stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and addictions came into play, you know, just kind of keeping in, keeping that at the fore. Because there's this... Um, romanticization around like moms and wine uh, you know yeah. right and i just like totally get that <laughs> zero right. judgment there right because i've done it um and yet for me that added depressant didn't help right you know so so the wine mom culture i completely want to validate and empathize with it there is a survival i am i am dying here on the vine i need pardon mm -hmm. the pun. Uh, I'm dying <laughs> on the vine and I need the vine. <laughs> and yeah. my personal direct experience is that it actually didn't help in the big picture. I mean, it helped survival, but it didn't help healing. Right. I think that's a really important distinction because right. I mean, especially if your, your, um, community is limited or your tools are limited, meaning mm -hmm. you don't have what you need. You reach for yes. what's available. Yes. And more, one more reason to have a stronger um, felt sense of community, like support that feels supportive, not yes. just people who are there. Right. And that's a distinction that you just named there too, because if we go to the mommy and me experiences, if there isn't resonance and empathy and love in that environment, mm -hmm. and even some laughing, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if that isn't there, then that may not be the particular resource for you. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's another version, you know, right. But I do have to say the more moms I speak with, the more, um, the more, well, the happier I feel, I feel less alone in the world. Um, right. And to, to what you were saying before the the statement of you are not alone, um, if it doesn't come with the support of you are not alone, can, um, is, is where the it, disconnect. It could be is. another way of saying you're good. <laughs> ah, right, right, right. Uh, I'm like, but I'm not feeling right. <laughs> Right. And yeah. having that support is, and PSI knows that very well, um, that, that, oh, the, the peer, what, what? that oh. PSI knows it very well that the, the peer to peer connection, that the support, like knowing that the person you're talking to gets it is yes. makes such a difference. Yes. 
really makes sense. Because, you know, again, with the multitudinousness, there was a lot of laughing, the four in the morning (laughs) breast milk. I mean, there's just, there's so (laughs) many moments of giggling that are, that there's, there's the potential for, Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, can't, we can't access the giggle, giggle always, but. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the main thing that I would love to know that I offered even for a milla moment um, is that there are a lot of us that are on it and we care really deeply and it's not okay. Mm-hmm. And we're doing everything we can to make this more visible, normalize this conversation yeah. um, and, and just have a bountiful basket of resources. You know, that's that's it because not everybody wants the same thing, you know, right. Right. We want our, our version of connection, our version of healing. So 8.1 billion people, what is it? 51% of them are women and some percentage are having babies. Yeah. Not everyone wants the same thing you said, and not everyone needs the same thing. And so the skill of listening Mm -hmm. and being present and, and really waiting for the, you know, that, holding that space and then waiting, helping someone come out with the, their ask, which has, I love that you have said it that way, both of you, you know, that support isn't really support unless you're present. It's not enough to say you're not alone unless you're offering support with it. So mm-hmm. that we do a lot of listening and I really respect. And I think people need to know that there, there isn't one thing mm-hmm. that's going to be the thing every pregnant or postpartum person needs except maybe for what Alana says, which is some space to be held and seen and cherished and listened to. So we, we specialize in that. And I really, really appreciate you saying that. Thanks. Yeah. It's, um, it's the, it's the space and, and the key piece for those who are, um, high functioning for lack of a better term, high functioning moms who are sort of whose heads spin completely around with this postpartum chapter um this the space offering and karen Kleiman uh has a book out called um I'm blanking on it but this holding in therapy i'll get i'll get the right title in a second so that i can say it but um the idea of offering space and listening for those of us who power through you know, cause I think about postpartum doulas who came for postpartum checkups or, and I didn't say much. And for me, what I would have loved is for someone to have been astute enough to go, okay, I appreciate your smiling. What else is going on for real? Yeah. You know, yeah. because a lot of them were totally okay with the one word answer and your pelvic floor is looking strong. Good for you. And, you know, it, it wasn't a real check-in. <laughs> I understand. It wasn't yeah. a real check-in. And, and I have to say that for all three times. It wasn't yeah. a check-in with me. It was the sort of requisite check-in, check the box. Yes. Yeah. It, it yeah. wasn't, a, how are you actually doing? Yeah. I, I I really relate to that. And as you're talking about being someone who is usually the strong one that people come to for advice, the quiet one. And so that's what we were talking about, holding the space, listening, but also facilitating that the, the moms, you know, your ability to ask for what you need. It's so new. It's so hard. And so there's a real art, but it's not a clinical art. It isn't. It's an art to say, okay, I see, I'm going to say, how are you really doing? Like I have the, all the time in the world mm. to hear you. I'm not in a hurry. That, I mean, that's, what you, mm-hmm. that's it. Like, even, even you saying it right now, my cells are like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, and, and again, what is that when you offer, you know, it's love in the form of space. It's love in the form of listening. It's love in the form of getting the cabbage broth. It's love in the form of saying, hey, hey, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> protecting the space. This is a sacred space. This woman just had a human fucking being come out of their body. Everybody, let's just even hold on that for a right. second. That will never not be nuts. Um. That will never not blow my mind in yeah. space. Yeah, so yeah. So it's a, this is a holy environment. Mm -hmm. 
and and for it to be treated as such you know even in the mundane poopy diaper moments or whatever it is take your time mm -hmm. you know i what pop into my head is the most one of the things that is a shining light for me in the pandemic times and that was the video of you alanis on the today show with your daughter while you're singing mm. and we talk about you know how songs can be kind of the thing you hold on to mm. and my song used to be "Ooh, child you know oh, like the comfort God. song but i gotta tell you that i have added a blaze mm. and when you are singing and she's just you're just dialoguing with her <laughs> everyone needs to see that clip well you know, we'd be happy to point to it if you give us permission, but today's show, yeah. Lana's daughter, mm -hmm. Blaze, you'll find it. And um, that is also space yeah. because you just, you just, you just are with, you just bring her in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, she's so fascinating to me. I'm just like, I'll do my thing, but what are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, the space. I mean, and when we're describing this quality and when you're even sharing, like when you're saying the words to me, for me, what it ponders is the, is the divine maternal queen. <laughs> you know, it's like space, empathy, wisdom, validating, vision, mm -hmm. effectuation. These are all the mom, queen, crone, archetypal pieces. Yes. You know, yes. that's what we've been. There's no like, I, I feel like women bodies don't start accessing these archetypes later. They're in us the whole time. And sometimes they're being evidenced and sometimes less so. But what you're what you're saying, and I think what we're all agreeing with here is that space that is being held potentially here for the postpartum mom is the momming. You know, it's almost like yes, yes. I, I want to receive. And here's the here's the prayer that I've had for the last while is I want to receive this love and I want to keep offering this love. Mm -hmm. And the difference really is is that I'm actually painting myself into the picture now. Because the early years of kids for me was a complete obliteration. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's just what it was. So so the returning into existing and being here and you know, having needs and maybe even having a capacity <laughs> that is maybe a little lower, you know, like just letting myself be the sort of moderate human. Um, but this quality of everything that seems to be resourceful inside this conversation are very maternal qualities. So we're leaning on or I'm leaning toward and reaching out for the very thing I'm constantly offering. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a big piece for me now, even, even with my youngest almost turning five is really looking at how I can be part of this party. How can I yes. receive it as much as offer it? I'm not going to stop offering it. We can't, right. but can I receive it to the large degree that I offer it? And, and that's, that's the star of Bethlehem for me right now. That's a big one. That, that is, that is really big. Um, mm. Yeah. You just like, <laughs> I felt that for real. I mean, yeah. it, I resonated with it big time. Yeah. Um, it's it. Right. And, and like healing this journey, healing journeys, advocacy journeys, this, this doesn't end. And it, it's um, yeah. like what you were describing earlier about the, the, um, I don't know what the word I want is. There's so many aspects to your experience and there's so many different aspects to healing and it doesn't have to be one tone. It's not right. just one thing. It's not just one experience. It's, it's everything. It's all yeah. of it. Yes. And when we minimize and uh, try and delineate, like this is how it should be. It really robs us all of the, the, mm -hmm the whole experience. Yes. And I, that from, from everything I've heard you talk about, that's, that seems to be what you're really about is just naming that it is a whole thing. And it is about lots of parts of who we are. Um, and we have to stop trying to live in this narrow lane of, of experiencing and healing. Yes. Beautiful. Amen. You know, this, yeah, this, um, even, even the, the trend of wellness is worrisome to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, I'm doing a, a talk next week about wholeness being, being what my eye is moving is, is, mm -hmm. you know, the prize my eye is on as opposed to wellness. Cause wellness, mm -hmm. is, you know, when I'm depressed and in the swamp and I hear about wellness, I just want to jump off a bridge. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, 
there's too much of a disparity between right. this, this, this idea, this concept of wellness. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's wholeness. And, and you were just mentioning that a second ago, Kat, like we are these whole beings and, and any element that needs to be filled in. And it could be a somatic thing. You know, I want to be more embodied. I want to dissociate less, jump out of my body all the time as one would, if they're trying to survive and disregard what's going on in here to keep going mm -hmm. right so right. that's the patriarchal imperative keep going at all costs right there's so yes. many credos and doctrines and this is how you do it in this world and most of them are born from disempowered masculine the wholeness i'm just saying this to you back to you over and over and you know i'm saying it with what is surprising amount of authenticity to me because i am aware that I'm talking to Alanis, but right now I'm just, I'm just talking to this beautiful new friend. I feel like, and saying, I just want you to know that that wholeness has always been there. Yeah. I just want you to know that mm. that's what you're saying to us, even as you're discovering it, but that, you know, we just describe things as broken, but what it, There's no you're broken. just saying it back to us. Yes. What does that mean? A broken compared to what? Yeah. What does it even mean? There might be less access to something. Okay. There might be a felt sense of grief. That doesn't mean broken. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. trauma, trauma, just try to break a spirit. It's not even possible. <laughs> you know, because the cognition will come in and the voices and the thoughts and all of them are going to do what they do. And some of them are sort of kind and some parts really beat us up because they're trying to protect the system. I get it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I, I, I believe wholeness is, and we often spend a lifetime returning to it, you know, and removing any false thoughts or beliefs that we made things mean when things were hard when we were little, and that's all we could do. We could just make it mean something. Right. And often it would be something would be made to be meant around our worth or our existence or whether we matter or we don't. Mm -hmm. you know? So, but all yeah. of those are just thoughts and they're actually not true. Right, <laughs> so, right. Often um, internalizations of somebody else's projection or somebody else's yeah. truth put upon us that we yes. are trying to shed. Yes. And man, if you're trying to do that while you have a brand new baby, that's like. Yes. And then, I mean, there's other conversations about brand new baby with another tiny little creature who. Mm don't they're not so happy about the new baby you know like right. oh, this, uh, <laughs> that'll be so part much. 93 of our <laughs> part 93 of our show um but yeah i um, you're welcome back for all of the parts <laughs> oh, thanks i love, I love it. alanis can you just share a little bit more about a blaze the song the experience the fountain it came from because it speaks to me so much it's so quite so beautiful and especially watching you sing it with your daughter the headphones on but talk to us about that what what is that about yeah i mean it's it was me wanting to get to the epicenter of what this love this particular love was for my children and and what i would want for them and it's terrifying because it's you know the thought is okay you have three minutes you know, in some ways, I want to write notes to my children for 100 years from now when I'm not around. And I want to let them know things before they even are in a quandary around it, you know. So with a song, it's this marking of an intention. And um, I can't sing that song live without, I have to not focus on the lyrics too much when I sing it live because yeah, right. I just want to weep yeah. in the best way. For sure. um, but that idea of, you know, my job as a mom is to keep that aliveness in them, in there. I think of us as unique filters and pieces of God coursing through all of us at various speeds. And the filters are unique. Um, and, you know, it's my job to facilitate their energies being expressed, you know, whether it's their rage or their artistic idea or their movement or whatever it is, you know, just that, that they're going to continue to be who they are and not do what our generation did and generations before, which is just cut off all these parts of ourselves to present well and then have to unpack it for 45 years in therapy. You know, it's like... Let's just skip some of that if we can. You know, I can't because my kids will need copious amounts of therapy with me as their mom. But, um, but the idea of having my eye on their vitality and their aliveness, um, 
Because I think my shadow is that is that the dead the deadness is the biggest fear I have, the lack of vitality, you know. And so postpartum depression had that in my face because it takes away the bla- you know, it takes away the flame, it takes away the light, it takes away a lot of things. Um, so writing that song in the midst of postpartum depression was my way of 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 really marking my intention because anytime I could get back to that. I could come back to the purity of me just supporting these creatures and developing and unfolding and and becoming who and being already who they were born to be is that's it. That's it. It's my only job. (laughs) It's a big one, but it's, uh, it's concretized in song now. So you're partly saying, I hear you saying the more whole you are not perfect, but whole, the more you can do that job for them. Be there for them. Keep keep that ablaze because you're painting yourself back into the picture. You're you're yeah, and not in resistance. For me, it's about not being in resistance to some part that they're exemplifying or embodying or saying or singing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like if if I can't go to the scary places with them, then they're abandoned. So for me to stay there, I remember my son. Um, feeling a lot of feelings when he was little, when he was four or five. And he said, mom, it's too scary in here. And I said, I know it's scary in there, but you don't have to go in there alone. I'm going to come with you, you know? So just going in with him and it was just like, wow, that's, that's everything. And for me to be able to see all the things that we typically look away from, Mm -hmm. which is maybe actings out or rage or fear or sadness it's usually just the feelings right we're scared of the grief sometimes Mm -hmm. um if i can't hold that in me i can't hold it in him but what i found i've i've gone backwards where if i'm troubled perhaps with my lack of capacity to hold something in me i just hold it in them and i learned this through the imago clinical training actually is if you can't do it for yourself do it for other and see how that feels and see how they respond, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so that ability to just um, hold space and that's the wholeness imperative. That's the wholeness return juice mm-hmm. is, is there's not much that's going to freak you out when others share like the capacity to hold even more bigger space mm-hmm. for, for the scarier thoughts, especially is huge. And I think of Karen Kleinman, I think of people and authors, just different authors I, re- I reached out to during this time to become, you know, whether it be mentored by them or, or receive therapy from them or advocate for them. It's um, their ability to hold space, no matter what I said about my marriage or about self-harm or about death. I mean, all these things that nobody wants to hear about often, you know, these, these therapists, you're in a very sacred position to hold this kind this quality of space. So I think that word is a big one. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, that it's, mm-hmm. it's beautiful. And the, like the holding space that ha- has uh, been offered to you in therapeutic settings or, or otherwise allows you to hold the space for yourself allows you to like the, the, the parenting that you're doing for, and with your children is also your own reparenting. It's also, it's just, it, it's this, um, I don't know what the word is for it, but it's, it's just this beautiful movement of, of healing energy that, um, you know, sometimes when people ask themselves, like, why is this happening to me? And that's a big question to ask. We don't always know the answer, but Mm -hmm. what I, have seen a lot of is that some of these deeper pains get the chance to come up for healing again. And sometimes that has to happen in relation, in relation to your partner, in relation to your children. And when you come out of it, like you have an R, um, it, it, like you can sometimes just feel freer than even you did before. No question. And, And that is a big one. That's a big one. Um, through direct experience, I can say that when we really look and feel and move and lean and receive, um, it becomes better than it's ever, ever, ever been. Like where I am right now is truly the most whole that I have ever felt. And I know so much of that is from the alchemical hewness of what postpartum just ground me through. <laughs> You know, it's like, had I not been through that, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't feel as, um, I wouldn't have as much access to these different parts of myself that I'm feeling more comfortable with. And am I still wrapping my head around the idea of mother as archetype? Of course, this is a very interesting patriarchal planet. So anyone who's an attempting to embody and become and live as any kind of divine feminine archetype, you know, there are forces at play that don't want that. <laughs> um, and then to keep doing it is, is the heroine's journey. <laughs> And we're all doing it. I mean, any any mom, like I had so many opinions about motherhood before I gave birth. Yeah. I, I would tell everybody my opinions, you know, <laughs> and I'd get some dirty looks, of course. Um, but wow, once I became a mom, I have zero opinion. <laughs> if you're still here and your kids are still alive, God bless you. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we for sure would be remiss um, and absolutely need to um, use this time to thank you for what you have done and what you're doing for with advocacy mm -hmm. um, in, in this space. Oh man, it's my it's my joy and it feels like an imperative. And it and it is very selfish too, just so you know, like the more I serve in this realm, the more I also receive. It's 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 such a win-win. <laughs> so it is my joy to advocate and support you both specifically and what you're doing in the world. And then also to just let people know that you exist already as a healing. And then to take it to the next level by really engaging with what you're offering and, and taking you up on the resources and the, the thought, you know, the thought partnering that you do together and I'm just really grateful and it's a no brainer for me to be here. <laughs> Alanis, we're so, so grateful and really, really excited and grateful that you, um, you, you've given a lot to lots of different nonprofits, but when you, your post pandemic concert, you invited three nonprofits to come and have exhibitor tables and to be in a video on the stage. And PSI was one of them. That is such such a huge step for a nonprofit to be able to say, Hey, we're on tour with Lannis. And <laughs> yeah, it kind of, it normalizes what we're all trying to talk about. Mm. And it brings it into the conversation that you were talking about. Like this should just be a subject, everybody. Yeah, and so ubiquitous, right? Everywhere. Everywhere, but you're bringing, illuminating that. We're just very grateful and wanted to have a chance to say thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. And also, recently, the, you know, the synergy of bringing together the artwork that came out of some of your songs, yes, and uh, and having an auction where purchasing um, some of the artwork is going to different charities, including PSI. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, beautiful, and and just so we're just really really in gratitude to that and i'm glad that it brings you joy because i know that being of service is part of you being whole i i get that yeah uh it sure it works out me. beautifully <laughs> yeah I, i'm happy about it it's it's i resonate so much with both your missions and i'm here i'm here to whatever degree i can be supportive and i love talking about it because talking about postpartum depression is talking about the world I think that's well Mike, said. Mike drop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it, it <laughs> absolutely is. it is. Yeah, it is. Oh, thank you so much, Alanis, for for coming on to the Mom and Mind podcast and for supporting PSI and all of our work. It's, um, it's it's really hard to sit in a room and not know where this goes out to, uh, like who it's going to impact. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I know that your voice and your presence and your power and your mission is, is going to support a ton of people mm. to get to the resources they need and to see themselves in your experience mm. um, and to know that there is a place that they can go and ways to heal from this. It's, mm. it's just incredibly powerful. And I thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, thank you for the same exact thing. Many, many thanks. And thank you very much, Dr. Cat and Mom and Mind yes. for holding space for us in this conversation. Yes. Holding space is my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> what I do best. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I did not do the hair toss thing. <laughs> yeah. um, well, it's been a, a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much.
Thank you both so much for what you do and for these, these, these moments of conversation with you. Thanks for your curiosity too. Appreciate it. What an amazing experience and an amazing interview. Alanis has just such power in her that I really, really admire. She's such a special human. I and PSI thank her so much for bringing her voice and herself um, here to this interview and to this cause. And being a leading voice in change just is so needed, especially in perinatal mental health. Those of you who've listened for a long time to this podcast or are not new to perinatal mental health really know how many people this impacts and unfortunately how many people feel like they have to be silent about their experience. So it's even more important to have somebody, a public figure like Alanis Morissette, who has just such a huge heart and capacity to give in this way. It's, it's remarkable that she spent the time with Wendy and I today. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Alanis. You can learn more about Alanis, her music, and events by going to alanis.com. You can also find her on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And thank you to Wendy Davis for your leadership. And thank you to Postpartum Support International, all the staff and volunteers and board who really make this organization run and keep it going so that help seekers can find it. Please find Postpartum Support International at postpartum.net with resources in English and Spanish available by phone and text at 1-800-944-4773. And what is so cool about this organization, there are so many free resources like online support groups, peer mentors, and a specialist provider directory for those of you seeking support. And PSI also offers training in perinatal mental health to therapists, physicians, nurses, doulas, and really anyone who wants to better support the people for whom they provide services. Follow Postpartum Support International on Instagram, Facebook, and most social platforms. And last but not least, if you are new to the Mom and Mind podcast, please subscribe and listen on your favorite podcast platform. You'll get each new episode delivered directly to you. You can always share the episode that resonates for you with someone you care about or share an episode that you know someone really needs to hear. And of course, come and follow on Instagram and YouTube. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time.